First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How recognized. How do they try to turn a guard? Well, President, uh, correction officer. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correction officer. Uh... How you guys doing? That's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. You know, guys, we've heard a lot about the dangers our brave men and women are, that are facing right now in corrections, the ones that work on the front line, but we rarely ever get a chance to hear from their family members, their loved ones. So with me right now, I have three wives of our brave correctional officers that work behind the wall. And the reason why I decided to do this topic was because I recently saw a news report that actually had um, Amanda Corrier on, correct? Hopefully I got it right. We'll find out once we get to her video. Um, and she just really stated her concerns along with Jennifer Giddings, correct? I'm doing pretty good. Just shake your head. We'll, we'll get to the unmute part. But, um, and I thought you guys really hit it right on, the, right on target, man, about what the concerns are. And I was like, you know what? This isn't really done on a national level. I don't think people actually ask what it's like to be the loved one of someone who's actually going through this right now, whether it's a correctional officer, whether it's a person from medical also, don't forget, we do have other essential posts that could be classification, management, food service, maintenance, mental health. I mean, the list goes on, but definitely when it comes to the interactions with the inmate population, correctional officers, medical, they're really, you know, every day they got to have that interaction, possibly a physical interaction. So it's great to kind of see what your thoughts are. So if you don't mind, can I, you guys introduce yourself, please? So Amanda, would you be able to go first? Can you introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, my name is Amanda Corrier. Um, I currently live in Cherubusco, New York with my husband. Uh, we have seven children. Um, we both had previous relationships and had children, and then we ended up with our youngest. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Jennifer, you mind introducing yourself? I'm Jennifer Giddings. My husband works at Clinton Correctional Facility. We've been together for 11 years. We have two beautiful children. I work outside the home as a home health care provider, and I have two patients. One is 87, and the other one is uh, 92. And Ms. Tisha Mills, you mind introducing yourself? Yep, my name's Tisha Mills. Uh, my husband's a CO at Clinton Correctional Facility. Uh, we have two kids. He's been in 11 years. We've been together 13 years. So that's it, <laughs> pretty much. It's, it's still a lot. Be, you know, being the spouse of a correctional officer, it's not an easy thing to do. So first off, let me thank you guys because there's a sacrifice that you ladies are making as well. Now, guys, we'll come back from our sponsors. We're going to explore the family's perspective. How do they feel, especially right now during the coronavirus? You know, what are their concerns? And do they feel that the department is doing enough? Clinton Correctional falls under New York State Department of Corrections which is directly under Andrew Cuomo. So guys, if you haven't, uh, the show Tear Talks to you, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor, and when we come back, we're going to, let's talk about the family's perspective. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career. It's going to save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now. Link in description. All right, and we're back. So guys, I'm gonna ask you a question real quick. So we'll go to, we'll go to Amanda first, then we'll go to Jennifer, 
and then we'll go to Tisha. But the first thing I, I want to ask is, how do you feel at this time when, when you know for a fact that your spouse, your husband is an essential employee, and especially going on with the coronavirus, the COVID, what are your thoughts about him having to go back to work during these times? So Amanda, can you go first? Okay, so my husband works at Upstate Correctional, which is a maximum security prison in Malone, New York. And at first, I wasn't too worried about this. I'm going to be the first to admit I was lax about the situation. I figured they've got this. It's, it's, it's a walk in the park for these people. And he was on vacation when we had the first inmate that was diagnosed in our county. And... I started to get nervous. He then went to work and inmates were being transferred still at that point. Um, in New York state, it's the draft bus. They, it's basically the Greyhound for inmates and they were loading up these inmates from downstate and shipping them all over the state of New York. Um, as what was said on national news, Harry Weinstein, the biggest, you know, person in the news right now that has it, um, was transferred on a bus with many inmates that were brought to uh, Upstate Correctional. There was inmates brought to Clinton Correctional. Um, so then the fear started to set in. And now it's not a case of if my husband will bring this home to me and the children. It's when is he going to bring this home? So it's a very real fear that I have to deal with every single day. And real quick, before we go to Jen, now I'm sure that He's been essential and called in on other issues before. I'm sure that, you know, this is what we do. We get called in. We have to be at that front line. What makes this different than other times? Because it's so unpredictable. Um, you hear the CDC say that people are getting sick, but they don't even know they're sick yet. So how do you contain something when you don't know if you've even got it, if the person that you're talking to has it, if the people around you have it? Um, he, he was a part of the search when the inmates escaped from Clinton Correctional Facility. So he was working 16, 18 hour days. He got, I believe, two days off the entire time that escape was happening. Um, so I'm, like you said, I'm used to him being called in. I'm used to him getting stuck. Um, that's how we put it. I'm not sure the correct terminology. Um, but at this point, it's, it's fearful because he's already been stuck once in the last week and we haven't even seen what this is going to be where we live. I mean, we, the three of us live, you know, between an hour and six minutes from the Canadian border. So we haven't had to deal with that up here. You know, you see the news and it's New York city. It's, it's the big city, you know, people forget about us up here. And though our numbers are small now, what are those numbers going to be? So that transfers into corrections with, what do you do when these correction officers can't go to work? Who's going to watch these inmates? So that is more time that we have to give our husbands up to the Department of Corrections, which gives them even more exposure to this illness. So, I mean, it, it's a very vicious cycle at this point, And I don't, I just, I don't feel like enough is being done to contain this issue. Right. And obviously the, the scary part of it all, it's a cycle that you can't escape. And that's no, the you concern. can't. Hey, Jen, what's your thoughts? So you have your husband going in. He's essential. You know, how are you taking the news? Honestly, it's it's horrible news. For the first time in 11 years that my husband and I have been together, like, I would always wonder, when is he going to come home? Is he going to come home tonight? Is everything going to be okay? You know, sometimes we would hear breaking news on, like, uh, my NBC5 or something. It, there was things going on at the prison. And then you sit there and think, oh, my God, when is he going to come home? Now I wonder when he's going to come home, what he's going to bring home. And, you know, all of these men and women that work for the Department of Corrections, give them so much and get so little back. Like they are literally putting their lives on the line, wondering if they're ever going to come home and see their families. And the department's really doing nothing to ensure their safety. And it, they, they need it. These people are the ones to protect us from these murderers, from these rapists, from these drug dealers, these horrible people, you know, and at the end of the day, they're still people and they still deserve to be treated like human beings. But the fact of the matter is, is, you know, with COVID-19 happening, it, this is a scary time, you know, and if your employer's not going to ensure your safety, you know, 
who's going to? You know, you know what's great about something that you were leaning towards, Jen, is the fact that I think when it comes to a lot of concerns, corrections has always been an afterthought. You know, like, yes, we knew this was going to hit the community, but then eventually it's like, oh, shit, it's going to hit corrections too. And then all of a sudden there's this big scramble when the moment it hit the community, we should have been ready for the fact that, okay, this is going to get our facilities and that's where there's going to be a lot of danger because that's where people are closed in and that's where it's going to spread exponentially. I mean, Rikers right now is hit hard. Uh, Rikers got the highest numbers so far, but again, it all started with one. So you want to do your best to prevent. Nothing's 100%. I like what Amanda said where, you know, it's not about if, it's about when. And we have to prepare for that. But you also want to make sure that, okay, but did we do enough? You know, that's the key. Because that's where also the liability is. Are we doing enough when it comes to those preventive measures, which we'll, we'll explore in a little bit. Hey, Tisha, what's your, what's your thoughts about, you know, now you got your husband. He's essential being called in. What's your fears? So... My husband's been on vacation recently, so he's getting ready to go back. And from January, since this broke, I have been watching it. And I got to tell you, my anxieties went from 10 to 1,000. Like, it's through the roof. I'm driving him crazy with it. Um, he did get a vacation, and he's ready to go back. Um, and I'm terrified for him to go back. I got two little ones at home. I'm afraid for me. Um, my mother lives upstairs. She's in her 60s. She's still working. I'm, we're all scared. And not. I'm scared about mostly about the health, but also the financial. People get called out sick if you don't have the time to cover it, and they don't pay for it. I mean, what about the new guys that don't have time? You know, what if they go in with symptoms because they can't afford to stay out? Um, there was a couple other things I was going to say, but the other girl said a lot of it too, but. Um, I don't know. I think they need to take more measures. I think the guys that could possibly be around anyone that's been exposed should be able to wear masks. They should be able to bring their own masks in at least at the very least. I know that where I work, they confiscated our masks and sent them to Albany. So I work for the state too, but not, not corrections, but they took our masks. So I just, I don't understand because if these high risk jobs can't protect themselves, it's going to overload our hospitals. And if Governor Cuomo sends, like he's talking about sending people upstate that have the virus to use our hospitals upstate, what happens when it breaks out here? And we have a huge prison. I mean, if it breaks out at that prison, they're going to bring it home to their families. And I'm afraid, what do I make my husband stay somewhere else? Do I make him stay in another room? Do I make him wear a mask at home? I mean, it, it's kind of hard to avoid, you know? I don't know. It's just so scary. I'm so nervous and anxious about it. Well, I'll tell you something. When it comes to our profession working in corrections, we know that there's an inherent risk. And what motivates us to do our job is the fact that we feel that we're protected. I mean, that's pretty much what our main motivator is, knowing that I'm going to go and do this job, but do people have my back? Because, you know, again, when you're a first responder, you know that you're going to get called right in. You know you're going to be that essential employee that's going to have to put themselves in some form of risk to get the job done. And the only thing that we expect in return is that I'm willing to do this, but you also have to protect me when I do it. You know, give me 100% effort. We know there's a chance that I may not make it home, but I need to know that you've given me 100% effort. I need to know that you have my back. And right now, from what I'm getting from the article, is that you feel that the, the, your husband's backs are not being protected. You feel that they're being exposed. So I thought we could start off with Amanda and tell me what some of those concerns are. And what I could do is, I've been following up on this nationally, and we kind of know at this point what are the accepted practices, what are expected for the agencies to do now. So there's really no point for any agency to be reactive. They should have been proactive, especially New York was kind of pioneering, leading the way. Now, when you have other states like I hit up afterwards and they're starting to pull ahead of New York, to me, that's kind of unacceptable because New York is kind of like that pioneer. But what do you feel right now the departments are failing to do in regards to your husband's well-being? Well, I think one of the biggest concerns I have is the lack of testing. I mean, we're seeing numbers every day. 
national news, local news, we're seeing numbers. You're seeing how many are infected. You're seeing how many have been, you know, treated and released, how many are being self-quarantined, how many have just, you know, died from this. But what are the actual numbers? Um, I'm told, um, I can't say by a completely reliable source, uh, because I can't fact check this per se. Um, but I'm told that on average, every facility in the, in the state of New York got five tests. Um, when you're looking at thousands of inmates in these facilities, five tests, that's nothing. Um, you have inmates that are sick that are being quarantined and they are handling that in the, in each individual facility, they're handling that as much as they can. Um, like you've stated there, every state has rules they have to follow. Every state has their, their set of standards. Um, but the facilities are handling it, but to what extent, I mean, you, you've still got the rec yard. Uh, you've still got people sitting by the hundreds eating, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How are you, how are you protecting my husband? How are you protecting his coworkers? How are you protecting other inmates when you're letting them congregate in numbers like that? Um, it's been shown that it takes one person to cause this. I mean, look at what happened in New York City. They found one person and how many hundreds of people did that one person infect who then it, it spread. And so, I mean, they, the governor, he, he canceled visits way too late as far as I'm concerned. Um, we, we as the public were told, you know, you need to be cautious. You need to be safe. Um, up here, I can't speak for the other wives, uh, but up here, a majority of the people that are coming to visit family members um, in correctional facilities are coming from New York City. They're coming from these infected areas. So this was being transported up here long before he canceled these visits. And then, you know, it was kind of lax on the stopping of buses and, and transporting these inmates around the state. So that was another factor. Um, now we have these in our facilities and we're still, I mean, my husband has to go to work every day, like normal, dressed in his normal uniform. Um, he can't carry hand sanitizer with him like other jobs. He can't wear a mask. He can't protect himself um, the way a lot of other people get to. And um, I don't want to get off topic, but uh, our local hospital in Plattsburgh, New York, CBPH Medical Center, has a doctor and a nurse who are both positive for this coronavirus. And they are using every protective measure available to them and they're still getting it. So what kind of standard are you setting for the Department of Corrections when you're saying basically you don't matter as much? You, you know, the way I put it um, before was cor uh, correctional facility is like a Petri dish. Um, in a scientist's lab, y you have the perfect setting for this because you have people that are in close contact. You have people right on top of each other. The transmission of this from one person to another is very simple. There's nothing stopping inmate A from infecting inmate B who has to get transferred to a different cell block or to his job because inmates have jobs within the walls. Um, he then infects that officer who then goes to the front gate who infects the other officer. So there's no means to slow that down. And, and I'm quite worried at the lack of care in this state by officials that have the right to make these calls. I mean, uh, the New York state department of corrections union, NYSCOBA has routinely throughout the last few weeks, I've been seeing their posts, their, their cries, to the governor to help us, please help us protect these men and women. And it seems like it's just falling on deaf ears. Right. So, you know, when you look nationally, you see a lot of the preventive measures that are being done. One is scanning people as they go in, checking their temperature, make sure it's not over 100.3. I think at one point you're at 100.4, you get sent home asking you some questions, um, you know, increasing the amount of cleaning that's done in the unit, increasing the supply of sanita uh, sanitizers, that are located at each entry point or, or even at each, uh, each unit, uh, you know, also educating the inmate population, you know, making sure they're aware of what's happening and trying to break away from some of the sensationalism from the news by really just trying to give them reality. Uh, unfortunately, if you have inmates that's just running around with just what they hear from the news, 
it's harder for staff to maintain control because the inmates are kind of just, you know, they believe in everything that's thrown their way. Sometimes the news just doesn't, you know, they don't think what they put out and how it's going to affect us. I, I believe it was in Yakima, Washington, and also in South Dakota that they made the scare of catching the COVID so great that inmates were just running out of these jails, running out of these prisons because of the fear of, you know, getting caught, but also the getting caught with the disease, but also the fear that, you know, the jails and prisons, yes, they're a melting pot, right? And, and obviously it could spread rapidly, but the news was also putting the effort that, yeah, well, we are, we're going to fail to protect these inmates, but you also have to protect staff. If you put effort to protect staff, staff can protect the inmates but they don't want to put that out there. They just want to make it look like that, you know, we have this pandemic that's going to explode at any point because we don't have the ability to protect the inmates. Well, first we need to do is protect the staff who then will go ahead and protect the inmate population because the threat is, it comes from the outside. So right now by them doing it backwards, by saying, we got to get the inmates out, we got to do this, we got to do that. Yeah, but what are you doing for staff? You're spending all these resources doing all this but that still doesn't stop staff from having to come in the next day. And I really feel that it's making staff seem that they're secondary to the cause. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your thoughts on that, Jen? I mean, Amanda really said it all. I mean, it, we've been talking for the past couple of weeks. We've really just got to get, you know, to know each other. And we, we, we feel the same exact way. It's, it's crazy because her and I are so much alike, you know, and our, our views on all of it are the same. And, I just, at the end of the day, the department is not doing enough to ensure the safety of these people that are putting their lives on the line. And they, they could risk it and lose everything, everything that they have. And at the end of the day, was it really worth it? I mean, it, they just, they need to ensure the safety of these people. I, I, I had said to Amanda today, I said, you know, it, once this starts spreading through the, the prison system, there's no, there's no really great um, ventilation system through there. So the chances of contracting it are, are extremely high, you know, and then my husband brings it home to me. I bring it home to the people that I care for. Our children get it. And when we need to get groceries, we have to go out in the public. Then we don't know because uh, your symptoms don't show for the 14 days. And I mean, we're potentially spreading it around everywhere. So we're at home doing our part. But when we have to go out and get the essentials, we're risking contaminating other people and, and we don't even know it's it's just so unfair and I feel like if they at least tried to protect their own it, maybe it would slow this down maybe it would stop I mean it, it has it, something has to be done well, before I go to Tisha real quick I want I want to ask you something so how has your life changed since this uh, since this pandemic so basically your husband's essential. He's got to go to work. You know, he could be coming home with the virus. How does that affect your mindset? And also, how does that affect the living conditions at the house? It, I mean, it's driving me absolutely crazy. I have anxiety to begin with. But since this has happened, it's been like beyond explosive. I mean, never, ever in a million years would I be terrified of my husband. He's like the most gentle, caring, loving man. And now when I, he comes home, I see 11 o'clock and I think, oh my God, he's going to be home soon. You know, and who wants to feel like that around someone that they love, someone that they've made a family with, that they've made a life with. And it's just, it's a horrible feeling. And, you know, for myself, I can speak for myself as well as a few others, um, correction officers, wives I spoke with, it puts a strain on your marriage because nobody wants to bring this home to their family. Nobody wants to potentially give this to somebody else, but the facts are the facts. What are you supposed to do? Tell them, Oh, you need to go stay somewhere else. You know, then they're missing time that they can never get back. It's just emotionally exhausting to, to be dealing with this. It really is. And, and, and Tisha, real quick, now your husband's been out of work, so now he's got to go back into work during this pandemic. Obviously, I would believe he's anxious, and obviously you're anxious. Um, does he want to go back, and, or do you want him to go back? Oh, he's only been off um, just vacation. It's just a regular vacation, but um, no, I don't want him to go back. Obviously, I know he has to go back. He knows that he has to go back, and it's causing, like Jen said, it's causing stress, and my anxiety is causing him stress. He's 
try, I, I think he's trying not to think about it, but I know that he is, and it's in the back of his mind, and he knows that I'm worried about it. And they basically touched on all the other stuff, too. I agree that the they're in such a confined space with these inmates that how, how are they not going to catch it? There's not enough ISO cells for them to, if it gets, you know, if it gets out, and they're not testing enough people up here. So how are they supposed to even know who has it and who doesn't have it? So that's why I think they should have the masks if they feel, you know, if they feel like they need to wear it, they should be able to, they should be allowed to wear it. Um, but no, I don't want, I don't want him to go back, but he's going back and he said he's just going to try his best as, you know, keep distance. But how do you do that? How do you do that when you're walking down a hall with inmates? You know, I mean, the halls are only so big and you got to stay close to them. I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible to stay six feet away. You know, they can't, they have to walk down catwalks and stuff. I mean, I don't know. It's just scary. I'm, I'm terrified. <laughs> I don't know well, what don't, to do. Don't forget, Tish. Also, they're there for safety and security. If a fight breaks out, they're putting their hands on these individuals. Exactly. You know, so, you know, and and do, they, do they have enough gloves? Do they have enough sanitizer? You know, I hope to God everybody is getting their temps checked. Inmates are getting their temps checked, and everybody's getting, you know, checked because there's no tests. So what are, we, what are they supposed to do? But I think Governor Cuomo needs to step up. He never mentions, when he talks, he never mentions prisons. He never mentions anything about it. He stopped the transfers to, or he stopped the visits too late. They're still, well, I don't know. If, I'm pretty sure they're still transferring. So that's scary. They're still transferring inmates from downstate. It's just, if it gets out and it gets bad, especially up here, our hospitals can't handle it. So imagine Clinton getting infected, bringing it home to their families, and then out into the community. It's gonna be, it's gonna be rampant up here. Well, you know what though? Even though you're three women sharing a concern, there are gonna be a lot of people out in this country right now sharing the same concern. Even if it's not just correctional officers, medical, police officers, you know, EMTs. I mean, it's true. We have to make sure we protect those first responders. And some states are even giving first responders a chance to automatically get tested. You know, if you're a first response, if you're a first responder, you can go ahead and get tested just to make sure you don't have it. Now, uh, going back to Amanda, when we're talking about the self-quarantine, obviously it's very hard to self-quarantine when you're with someone that's essential because they're putting themselves right on the line and then they have to come home. Uh, I know I asked Jen the same question, but uh, again, what about your routine? Has anything changed with your husband since he's been going back and forth to work and, you know, what's like at home? So when my husband started going back to work, um, I've, I've always been the perhaps too nice of a wife. Um, I get all of his stuff ready for him the night before. It's all laid out. He's got everything he's going to need. He just has to wake up and get dressed. And the first day he went back to work, um, he was on his way home and I had to tell all the kids, okay, go to your rooms. Nobody touch him. Nobody come near him. He needs to come through the door. He needs to get undressed. We live on a main road. So him undressing in the front yard probably isn't the best idea. Um, but I have seen a lot of wives. Uh, there, there's a, a photo that was shared numerous times in our area of a wife. And she took a picture of her husband undressing outside and having to walk, you know, run in the house in his underwear and go right to the shower. Um, so we've got... We've gotten put into a position where we are a wife, but the three of us are also moms. So we have to now protect our children from our own husbands, from their fathers, because, you know, who's to say that this doesn't affect one of our children in such a negative way that, you know, we're stuck in the hospital with a child now. And it's, it's terrifying. Like everyone has said numerous times, um, you know, my husband came home one day and said that they stopped taking temperatures. And I asked why, because I was quite concerned at the fact, you know, wasn't that one of the preventative measures to make sure that people coming into the prison weren't sick? And uh, they were using the ear thermometers, which as any mom who's ever used them knows, they're not very accurate. Um, so with 
that false information, that false sense of security that you're getting from that thermometer, the Department of Corrections said, now we're going to order better ones. So in the meantime, it's my understanding that they're not even taking temperatures at this point. So you've already got it with inside the facility. Um, the local news station broke that Clinton um, Correctional had gotten the first positive case within our area. Uh, we're the northern hub of uh, the Department of Corrections. And then uh, Franklin uh, Correctional Facility, which is in Franklin County, New York, in Malone, um, they ended up with a positive case with an officer. Um, so you've got, you've got this spreading, but to the extent we don't know, um, we don't know who's sick, who's not. We don't know the man who's, you know, heading into the, the jail, if he's sick or is he going to be sick now before he leaves that jail. And we have no preventative measures to figure out who is infected at this point. And it's a very real aspect. And like you said, it's not just corrections. Um, I understand this is a corrections platform and we're talking as corrections wives, but being someone who, you know, was an EMT. Um, with many friends who are in EMS, uh, family members who work for the local hospital, doctor's offices. Um, you've got this situation that is completely out of control. Do I know how to fix this? No. I, do I believe that anyone truly knows how to fix this? No. But why are we not trying? Why are we not putting our foot down and saying enough is enough we will do what we have to do. We will risk, you know, a two week quarantine for the entire state. If it means that my family, my, my relatives are safe. My husband's father isn't doing well right now at all. Um, we have, I'm going to try not to get emotional. Uh, we haven't been able to see him personally face to face in over three weeks. He has COPD. His lung function is below 20%. Uh, this could kill him. Um, there's no easy way to say that this, this could kill uh, my father-in-law. And, you know, we're video chatting. Our children are getting to talk to him that way. But it's a very real situation when you look at the fact that we have perhaps had our last face-to-face -face visit with the man that we love. Because how long is this going to go? You know, I, I keep hearing and it's driving me insane. Let's flatten the curve. Um, but are we really flattening it at this point? The numbers are still rising. And that's only numbers coming from big cities. You, we're not taking into account that, yes, we don't have a dense population where we live, but we're not testing either. Um, we have tests and we're testing with what we can, but you call a local doctor's office, you call the local hospitals and they're using them up quicker than they can get them. So people who need the tests aren't given them. They're, you know, you're being told, go home, stay there for 14 days, wait till your symptoms pass, take care of yourself. If it gets worse, come back. But people like that aren't listening as well. I mean, there was an article uh, posted just today that um, an individual had gotten sick. They were told to, you know, self-quarantine. Um, and they were running around like nothing was wrong with them, infecting countless people. Um, so, I mean, for the aspect of corrections, you're basically, you, you've already got a set up to stop this, so to speak. And I don't mean, it, you know, it's, it's fail safe, but if you lock down a prison, um, m I'm hoping many of your viewers know what that means. Um, you're essentially keeping everyone separate. Everyone goes to their cell. That's where they stay. In my opinion, that makes it a lot easier to keep the sick people away from the well people it distances people like we're supposed to be doing as civilians. Um, and you're giving it a, giving officers and inmates both the chance to help slow this down. Um, you brought up a good point about, you know, this is going to be brought into the prison. It's not, it wasn't something that was in the jails that's getting out. It was something that was brought in. But now we're looking at a reverse up here where it was brought through the prison system up here and now it's coming out of the prison system. Um, the, the, the gentleman from Franklin Correctional Facility in Malone, New York, who tested positive has roommates. Um, one of those roommates is also sick um, and they, don't ha they didn't have a test. I'm not sure if they've tested him recently, but he works at a different facility. So now you're going from one facility to another. Um, it's my understanding that the other person is self-quarantining at this point. And like um, one of the other wives had said, he is 
kind of new, but he's got the time to be able to do that. Uh, but you're jumping through hoops when you're sick because now you need a doctor's note. Well, doctors don't want to see you. Doctors are saying, don't come to my office. I don't want to see you if you're sick. Stay home unless you need emergency care, then go to the hospital. So it, it, it's a catch 22. I mean, I get that they're trying to do something, but they're not doing enough. They're not doing what they are able to do. Um, there is an ability to lock these jails down. There is an ability to lock this state down. There is an ability to do a lot of things that aren't being done. You know, the focus for Andrew Cuomo, and I, don't, I, I hate to be a political person, but is the big city. He is worried about New York City. You hear him talk about Northern New York. He's talking about Albany. <laughs> we're three hours from Albany, and we're still New York citizens. We still pay taxes in New York. My husband still works for the, the state of New York. We matter. And we don't feel that correction officers matter in this man's perspective. We don't feel that we're being taken serious as families of these employees. And we feel like, you know, our, our concerns are falling on deaf ears. Well, I'm going to tell you something, man, man, that you hit a lot of good points there. Uh, you know, I'm just absorbing and learning. One of the things I like, you, I like that you mentioned is that, you know, you kind of complimented what I said. Was that right? You know, at one point the threat's coming in, but now we have to be ready because the threat is now coming out, you know? And I think a lot of people haven't looked at it from that perspective yet. So it's good to get that out there right now because that's the key. If anything, if we're not even worried about the prison system and worried more on the community, now the community can be affected by uh, what's going on in the prison system. Now we all are connected for once. And... <laughs> Like you also mentioned with the um, officers inability to, you know, quarantine themselves. Like I, I agree. I, I would like to see, this sounds crazy guys, but I would like to see a lockdown, right? What I would like to see is staff stationed somewhere. And yes, they get paid for the time that they're there. It is what it is. Get that FEMA money, get something, pay them for their eight hours of sleep and you can work them for 12 to 16 hours, whatever it is. And I'll guarantee you a lot of staff would step up and do that. As long as they feel compensated, trust and believe, they'll step up and they'll want to do that because they're not going to want to go home. They're going to say, honey, since I'm doing this, they offered us to stay at this hotel. It's a quarantined hotel, whatever it is. We're just going to stay here until this passes. And I think that would be phenomenal because you're going to limit the traffic coming in. You know, you got the same people going back and forth. And for the people that, you know, are not able to, let's say, I mean, you can't get every officer, but you still take care of the other officers that can't come in. You know, if, if need be, God forbid, something, they could be the backup coming in, you know, but I would like to keep things as consistent as possible because, again, people come home, they come back. There's a fear every shift that something can ignite, you know, so if you lock it down and keep it with the same people, it limits the fear. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's that next level. There's one question I wanted to ask you before we, we go to Jen real quick is how old are your kids and how do you have to explain it to them as to what's happening between them and their father? Because I know you said you have one child that you share, correct? Yes. He's three. three. Yes. So how, 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 how do you do that? How do you communicate this to a three-year-old? Um, so basically, um, my husband has three sons. I have two daughters and a son from before we had gotten together. Um, our kids rage from three years old all the way to 17. <laughs> um, so it's with the older ones, it's easy. Um, they kind of get, get grasp the whole wash your hands. Don't touch your face that much, even though I keep managing to touch my face. Um, you know, th they get the risk. They also realize, you know, we can only do so much, so we're not going to fear it every day. Um, I'm pretty good at hiding it. I'm trying not to show them because it's easier for them to just go about their day. They're young. Uh, by three-year-old, that's a little more difficult. He is a daddy's boy. Um, he loves his daddy. He waits in the window for him. When daddy gets stuck, there's meltdowns and freakouts. Uh, so it's been more, you know, when I know he's on his way, he will text me. And it's kind of, come on, buddy, let's go do something over here. And we go to the other end of the house, kind of preoccupy him. So that gives my husband a chance to get off all of his dirty clothes get cleaned up, get everything washed up so that we don't have to worry that he's going to get it. Um, 
I, do, I did want to go back to one thing real quick though. Um, because you had brought up, you know, making it longer shifts. Uh, my husband has also said the same thing. You know, he has two individuals he works with right now. Um, one has a little girl who's battling cancer, uh, for the second time. Um, one has a wife who's battling it right now. Both, um, are not in good health. They're not in good shape and they're not sure what's going to happen with these individuals. Uh, the husband whose wife isn't doing well, um, had a breakdown. He was losing it in his car before going into the prison because he knew that if he brought that home, he's killing his wife. Um, so to, to hear somebody on the outside of this, you know, have the same perspective is quite reassuring. I mean, I understand it's the same, uh, the same job. Um, you obviously understand corrections quite well, uh, but it's, it's nice to have somebody on the outside say, you know, that is a good idea. That is, and, and that is something that I know, like you said, numerous officers would definitely stand up and say, you know, I'm, I'm game for this. Even if it was a week at a time and you're doing 12 hour shifts, rotating, whatever the case may be, anything that slows this down and stops it, something has to, and the, the only analogy I can come up with is something needs to cut the head off this snake. And if we can't band together, I, I'm, I don't care if you're a civilian. I don't care if you're a correction officer. I don't care if you're a nurse that's working in the infirmary. We're, we are all in this together. This disease, this virus, I should say, doesn't care if you're black or white. It doesn't care if you're gay or straight. It doesn't care if you make a lot of money or you don't make a little, you know, you don't make diddly squat. It's, it doesn't care. This is affecting everybody, young and old, uh, rich or poor, and we we're spending so much time being political right now and Democrat versus Republican and black versus white. And we need to band together. The only way we're going to stop this is if we all work together and we all should be angry. We all should be upset that things aren't being done and that precautions aren't being taken. And these ideas aren't being taken serious because you're coming up with ideas. I'm coming up with ideas. The other two women that you're speaking with have all come up with ideas. And, you know, you've got unions and you've got members of those unions and you've got officers and you've got civilians that work in these prisons that are saying, listen, we need to try this. We need to try that. And it's, it's going in one ear and out the other. And it's, it's disappointing you know, our husbands lay their lives on the line every day. You think law enforcement, you think cops, you think sheriffs, you think border patrol, you think the guys with the guns and the cars with flashing lights, but you don't think about the men and women that stand behind those bars every single day with the monsters that get locked up there. And yes, yeah, some are, some are, you know, people who messed up, they, they made a mistake in their life and they need to learn, you know, I messed up and how do I fix this? How do I not be that person anymore? And I commend those people. But in my husband's facility, and I can't speak for them all, I mean, he's got the worst of the worst. He's got mass murderers. He's got, you know, pedophiles who have, you know, raped numerous children. He's, he's keeping the nightmares that we have at night locked up in cages. And He's getting no respect for that. He's getting, you know, nobody is even blinking an eye that he's putting his life on the line in another way now by possibly infecting hundreds of people. I mean, if you look at the fact that somebody who works in these facilities has to get there, so they need to get gas, they need to, you know, pick up whatever their wife, I do this all the time, needs from the local store. Every time they leave that facility, there's a fear that if I stop and get gas, I'm going to leave something on this gas pump. If I go to grab that gallon of milk that my wife didn't need this morning when I came to work, I'm going to infect whoever I come into contact with when I use that keypad to use my debit card. Um, and it's a very real fear. I mean, my husband has literally come home, completely changed, completely cleaned up, and then left again to go get me the things I need because he's scared to infect someone inadvertently. Um, a doctor who's a friend of mine said it reminds him of glitter. Um, I have kids. You all have kids. So you all know the, you know, the, the, the sheer annoyance of glitter. Um, you get it on your hands. You get it in your hair. You get it all over your house. And you can't get rid of that for months. 
it's the same aspect. You can wash your hands, you can wash your face, your hair, you can clean up, but there's always going to be that one speck of glitter you didn't get. And that's that one speck of glitter that is scaring us because that can infect so many people. All it takes is that one little speck and, and you can't stop it. You know, you, again, you hit up a lot of good points, uh, you know, but, but it's great to get it out there because a lot of people, we may hear it from frontline and, you know, but we don't hear from the families that are affected. And I think that adds to the weight of the severity of, of what's happening here. So some people may say, oh, well, it's just the front line. They're complaining, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. Well, now we got the families coming in. So when is it that front line does have a, a voice? You know, because if the inmates' families speak, people listen. So now we have the families for the officers that are speaking. So when are we going to listen to that? You know, that, that's, that should be the next step. And uh, going to Jen now. Jen, how old are your kids? Uh, we have a five-year-old and a 16-year-old. Okay, so how are they handling? How do you explain what's going on to them? My five-year-old is just still too young to really understand. We're trying to keep our distance as much as we can. My 16-year-old really does know. I mean, he's not depressed, but every single day he's scared. You know, he's saying... You know, we're doing what we can. We're not going places. We're staying home. They play outside, you know, uh, video games, all of those things that kids really do. But at the end of the day, he, he knows when, when we get it, that's, that's where it's coming from. And my husband tries as best as he can, you know, he come, he works doubles. So he works two doubles and then he has four days off, thankfully. Um, but at night when he gets home at 1130, he literally grabs our Lysol can he sprays his boots down, he strips at the door, and all of his clothes go right into our washing machine. It started, and then he heads right up the stairs and into the shower, and that's the best that we can possibly do. You know, my five-year-old wants to be all over him because he hasn't seen his father in two days, and he just absolutely thinks the world of him, and he's just stuck to him like glue. Um, so it's, it's really hard to put that distance between them and he just doesn't, he just doesn't understand, you know, and I'm like, don't get in his face, don't get close to him. But how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you tell them that they can't do that? You know? And I feel like if one of us in the, the house is going to get it, we're all going to get it, you know? So should there be that distance? It's just, it's so unfair. Well, you know what, Jen, one of the things, um, obviously, uh, it, I, I kind of go through that right now. I have two young girls as well. So I'm going through the process of stripping down before I come in and, you know, going through the procedure. But again, I'm always wondering, is it enough? You know, that's always my concern. Like, is it enough? You know, I, I took off the clothes. I'm taking the shower downstairs. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But Am I doing enough? I mean, that's that's a, a concern right now where even if we take these precautions, like like Amanda mentioned, it could be that one piece of glitter that I'm just not seeing or the simple fact that, you know, I forget to do something so minor and in the routine of life, I, I hug my daughter because I want to hug my kids. It's what I do. And then it's like, oh, shit, I forgot. Let me go clean myself. I, I mean, it is really scary times. But in the end, we have to remain calm and collective because kids feel our emotions they read off our emotions and if ever we look like we're out of control then it makes matters worse so we got to kind of fake the funk which makes it harder but it also makes it harder on that frontline professional who like your husband who has to go to work but also try to tell you that everything's okay we got this you know when i'm sure he's battling stuff because he wants to be protected and you know, it, it, and then you have to kind of deal with that as well with the children. So it kind of has that ripple effect, right? Where you expect your husband to insure you and then your kids expect you to insure them. Absolutely. It, it really does. I mean, you have the nail on the head, but it, at the end of the day, the only thing that we can do is just beg the Department of Corrections, beg the governor to, 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 to do something to ensure our safety, to stop making families have to be so distant. I mean, we all reside in the same house, you know, it's just, it's, it's such an awful feeling. It really is. Well, Tisha, do you have kids at all? And if so, how are you going to prepare them for your husband uh, coming back on vacation, back to work? So I've already been preparing them before he went on vacation, but um, he also does other work. So he's been doing the same thing, coming in like, 
taking his shoes off outside the doors, sweatshirt, everything, stripping down, showering, all that. But um, I have a three, three and a four year old. My daughter's three. My son is four. Um, I've gotten them into really good hand washing. They're pretty good at it, actually. I've been teaching them to cough into their arm and whatnot, all those things. Um, they do good. They do as good as they can. You know, they're three and four, so sometimes they forget, but they actually are doing pretty good. It was shocking the other day when she did it, and I was like, wow, I couldn't believe she did it. <laughs> but um, as for him, when he goes back to the jail now that there's, you know, it's more broke out up here, I'm more worried now. I'll be more worried when he goes back. Um, because I've heard that, I mean, you hear so much, but I have heard that it can linger in the air. And I also know that they said that um, it's passed through uh, urine and feces. So if somebody flushes a toilet and it emits into the air. So there's things that you hear that, you know, there's so many different outlets you're hearing from. Do you what? Who do you believe? And you know, there's all those things in the back of your head. Like, is that true? Should we all be use like? Should we be using separate bathrooms? We only have one bathroom. <laughs> so, I mean, I, f I feel the same as they do about everything. Everything they said, I feel exactly the same way. Well, you know what? You know what you're hitting right on the spot is that we talk about the un known fear. That's kind of the reason why I'm doing these videos right now, because I've, I've had doctors on there explaining stuff, because I, I want to make sure that if we have concerns, that they're realistic and not sensationalized. I, I believe that, right, even especially as an agency, you know, we have limited resources. Are we wasting all that resources on something that's unrealistic, or are we really focusing on what's there? And also being able to get that word out to staff and the inmate population. So, I mean, I, I think the best advice here is that, like you mentioned, is you know, before we jump with that anxiety of the unknown, is it realistic? I mean, you know, I heard this today. How can we confirm that? You know, right. because the, the last thing, you don't want to be wasting energy on these unrealistic concerns when you really need to be having that energy on, you know, what really matters. Exactly. I have, I have one more question I thought just could go around the table. Now, your husband's work in high-level security, so hopefully there are gloves available to the unit minimal. And the reason why, not just gloves, but also masks, is when you're dealing with high-level inmates, and let's say for some reason they have to get moved from one place to the other, they have to get moved in restraints. And if these inmates are symptomatic, they can't cover their arms. They can't, you know, cover their mouth. So as soon as you see that they're symptomatic, the officer needs to put the mask on them immediately. And then obviously if there's a backup mask, they put it on themselves. But you got to put it on the threat, which is that person coughing it up. And again, if you're in that high level area and you got an inmate that's coming out with all these restraints, that inmate's just going to be coughing in the air, you know? Right. So you got to make sure that inmate takes that mask out. And one of the questions we had recently was, you know, if you had an inmate that was resistant to taking their temperature, an inmate that was resistant to seeing medical, can you force them? And I spoke to a doctor that says, Hey, Ganji, the temperature is not a medical procedure. So yes, you could do what you can to scan that temperature and take it. Now, if the inmate is refusing medical, like a test to see if they have it, then you treat them as if they do. You isolate them. You do what you got to do until the inmate starts to cooperate or the said time passes where medical is comfortable enough to say, you know what, this person doesn't have it. But either way, officers are going to have to deal with that resistance with inmates that are not going to want to get checked or not going to want to move. And at that point, they got to realize that, you know, we could still make it happen. You could still, you know, from what the doctor told me, again, they'll have to confirm this. This is just information that I'm getting, but that it's not a medical procedure. So you could be able to tell that it may, no, you're getting your temperature checked, you know? And the other liability is, is the fact that these preventive measures that we put in place, even though they're not 100%, it will show that we're not being negligent. We're not being negligent towards staff. We're not being negligent towards the inmates. So we need to get those temperatures read. That's key right now because that's the symptom that people can go on notice. I had someone uh, recently tell me that they had someone by the door that was rocking 103.5 and didn't even know it. Like, you know, just didn't even know it. So this is not something that is surfaced that people realize. So that temperature is key because maybe the temperature comes out before the obvious symptoms if they are symptomatic. Now, the one last question I wanted to ask is, 
if they have to get quarantined or if they're, you know, exposed or if they have the coronavirus, are they covered when they go on leave? Are they on paid administrative leave? So, Amanda, would you want to go first? So it's my understanding, um, again, uh, I, I don't know everybody, uh, but if my husband were to get sick um, and he needed to be quarantined, uh, he needs a doctor's note. He needs something stating that he was advised to stay home. Uh, then he is taking and using his time, uh, sick time, vacation time, and using that so that he can still get paid. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it works with everyone, um, but I do know that when I questioned him about that, because we are a one-income household, uh, I was working full-time, but with having a three-year-old and now all of this happening, my plans on going back aren't happening anytime soon. Uh, so we're living off his income as a family of nine. Uh, so that was one of my really big issues at first was, okay, you get sick when you get sick, because it's not if, it's when, and you're not allowed to go to work. What do we do? So yeah, that's how he basically explained it to me that once he proves that he can't go to work, um, he just doesn't go to work. He's out for 14 days and then back to work business as usual. <laughs> Well, a lot of states are covering that leave for that individual, even if they're out taking care of somebody with COVID, if they had child care concerns, you know, if they themselves contract coronavirus, a lot of states are, are alleviating the worry by saying, you know what, you'll go on a separate leave and we'll cover you. Now, the cool thing about that is that also motivates people to do the right thing. You know, I do feel symptoms, let me get checked and not be worried about, oh man, if I'm out of work, I'm not going to get paid. So there is a proper motivation. Now, granted, management's always going to say, well, there will be people that are misusing it. Yeah, but you know what? Let's act on universal precaution. We can figure that out later. But the key is, is that right now, if someone's symptomatic, how are we motivating them to report that and not show up to work to get us all affected? And one of the things is, is to give them that paid leave. It's one less worry. And then when you're ready to come back and you're cleared, you come back. So what about, about you, Jen? Same, same situation. Do you know if uh, they're covered? Um, it was to my understanding that the, if they show symptoms or they have a temperature or anything like that, that they have to get a doctor's note. And at that point in time, they um, need to submit that to the facility. But um, it it's also came to my attention through another um, officer that actually was tested and awaiting the um, results of his test that he was not going to be paid for those two weeks that he had to be quarantined unless he could get a test. Thankfully, um, the hospital, CVPH, um, decided that he needed to be tested for it. So now he will receive the pay for that. But like I said, there's there, there are only um, testing select people if you meet that criteria and you know if my husband does contract this or he's showing symptoms and he doesn't have any tests that are available to him he's gonna have to use his own time okay so you know what what I'm gonna do is when I post these videos up there's a slow roll and then they start to gain some traction so if anybody's familiar with the system that you guys have in play I'm curious to see if they're giving you that paid leave I know a lot of states are I'm just very curious to see what your state is doing, specifically New York, but also your state, because I've heard some things from Florida as well. But again, I'm not in a position to confirm. So we'll see what happens when we start sharing the video out and just seeing how people answer that question. Hey, Tish, uh, same, same thing. Um, you know, would your husband be covered? From what I'm hearing, um, I heard that there was a guy out uh, from another wife that uh, he wasn't being covered, that he was using his own time until he got so sick that I think it might be the same person Jen was speaking of. I'm not sure. But um, until he got so sick that they basically had to give him a test. But they recently said, I think it was today, they posted that they basically have no tests. Very, very few. So they're only doing people that are really bad. So, you know, what about the people that are just on the cusp of it and it's not that bad and they are bringing it into the prison. I mean, it, it just, it's going to spread. So, and the prison's one of the worst places because everything is steel. It lives longest on non-porous surfaces. So I heard it can live up for to 21 days on um, 
metal surfaces, any non-porous surface. It's horrible. So, I mean, what are the cleaning measures? What are, and by, by the way, why can't they be locked down? I mean, the rest of the countries on quarantine, why can't they be put in their cells for two weeks? Or I, I just feel like they're, they could do something more. I feel like they're not doing enough. And I feel like Governor Cuomo isn't listening to us at all. So those are just well, that's how I feel. Well, I'll be honest with you. I will guarantee you that not only would staff support that, but a lot of the inmates would also say, you know what? Lock me down. You know, I, I don't want to have that interaction. I mean, a lot of inmates would be happy when you cancel the visitors coming in or the volunteers, because one thing is they don't want to get sick, but they, don't also, they also don't want to get their family sick. You know what I mean? So, you know, for them not to move forward and do this, I still, people, I still feel that people think it's still extreme. It's not extreme. We're in extreme times right now, and this is the normal reaction to the extreme time that we're in. Uh, Amanda, would you like to say anything in closing? Um. Well, first, I want to thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. Um, we have been sitting in our little Facebook group, um, talking back and forth, trying to just feel better. Um, the anxiety, the stress is getting to us all. So it kind of gives us a little bit of an out. And when you reached out, we were, we were all excited, all three of us, uh, for the simple fact that we knew that we had somebody on our side that cared enough to listen. Um, Will this cause change? I hope. Um, it's not a guarantee, but it's an eye opener, like you said, for many. Um, because so many tend to look at corrections and think, you know, oh, that's not my problem. Um, I'm not married to a correction officer. I'm not, you know, my, my father isn't in corrections. My mother doesn't work in corrections. So you don't, you, you think you're invincible when it comes to issues that are happening behind those walls. But this is an issue that's going to affect everybody. Um, we all live in a community where, you know, I want to say at least 80% of us have somebody in our family that works in the Department of Corrections, one aspect or another. Uh, I know that I have, you know, my, my daughter's uh, father and stepmother both work in the Department of Corrections. So, you know, everybody has somebody up here that they know that works in the department. And, through, like, you, like you had said earlier, this isn't just our problem now. This is everybody's problem. This is already behind the walls. So now it's spreading through there. And now those people who work there, both civilian and officer, are bringing that home. They're bringing that to our communities. Um, so it, it, it's something that needed to be said. It's something that everybody needs to just stop and give pause to. Um, I also, I, I want to thank everyone on the front lines, all essential employees. Um, at this point, it's nice and it's, it's almost moving to see everyone from, you know, a border patrol agent to the person stocking shelves at Walmart all being looked at in the same light. Um, nobody's being looked down on. Nobody's being treated as if they're less of a human being by their job because they are all important. Um, everybody is in this together. Everybody is equally being exposed to this when they have to work. Um, Tish and Jen, or sorry, Tisha and Jen are both, um, they're both working right now. They're both putting their lives on the line. They're both putting themselves out there in a, in a world that we're not used to. I mean, we've never been subjected to something like this. We've always sat back and watched other countries deal with this and said, you know, that'll never happen here. We don't have those problems here. And now we've got that problem here. And I mean, all essential employees, everybody who's working and still stuck going out of their homes every day and risking bringing that home. I personally, for myself, for my family, I can, I, I'm almost certain I can speak for the other wives. We thank you. We thank you for doing something that's scary. Um, something that nobody signed on for. I think that's the, the one thing that I'm sick of hearing is, you know, they can't complain. They signed on for this. I don't, I don't believe that anybody went, you know what? I, if there's a global pandemic, I'm not worried about it. I'll still want to do this job. Nobody signed up for this. This is not something I signed up for. Um, any of us signed up for this is, this is something new to us all. And instead of dividing this nation and making it, you know, person against person. We need to work together and try to figure out what's the best way to solve this and, and what's the best way to handle this. You know, you said something perfect. This isn't a job you do strictly for the money. This is a job that it's in you. 
you know, at the end of the day, it's in you. Uh, it's just, it's, it, it takes a hell of a person to work this type of profession, uh, especially now being essential, especially times like this that have to go in and the sacrifice you're making, you know, to, you know, do the job, you know, and a lot of people don't see it because again, corrections is forgotten. Um, hey, hey, Jen, any closing thoughts? Honestly, I wish that they would just lock the prisons down, lock all of the prisons down in the state of New York, put borders up, stop people from coming in and out of New York and protect our law enforcement. Honestly, if we don't start by doing something, even if it's something big, something small, it, this is never going to end. It's a vicious cycle. They're already talking about, you know, we can start expecting this to wind down in, in August. And there's just going to be all of this time lost. And the longer that we wait, the longer it's going to spread. And it's just going to keep going on and on and on. And more lives are going to be lost. It's a scary thought. You know, it is. But like, I, I like what Amanda's saying, you know, we have to prepare for the worst, but still be hopeful for the best. Absolutely. And it's kind of, it's kind of what we do every day. Hey, yeah. um, Tish, any closing thoughts for the audience? Um. No, I mean, you guys all said it, said it great. I think some of the union reps are really trying hard and I hope they get, I hope somebody listens to them and I hope we can band together and get somebody, especially Governor Cuomo to listen, hear us and take it serious. I mean, I was kind of hopeful they would lock New York City, quarantine them or quarantine the whole state for two weeks. Cause like she said, the longer it goes on, the worse this is going to get. They're worried about the financial aspect. Well, I mean, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, if, especially if we go till August. Oh, my God, everybody will have it. But they said everything perfectly. So, And, and you know what's great? Before we go into closing, you know, as we post these videos up, I mean, right now, obviously, there's YouTube's kind of limited with some activity because obviously everybody has greater focuses. But I'll tell you something, for the people that do watch it, for the people that do stay in tune, there's an interest to it. And eventually the word will get out, you know, that, you know, this is what the family members think. And for once, it would be great to get that perspective out. And hopefully, like you said, the governor listens to this. I, I want to add one thought though, real quick, you know, in the profession, we're always told that you kind of leave work at work and home at home. And I agree with half of that. I agree that you kind of leave home at home, you know, but sometimes when you're going through the stress of the job, the people at home know you best. Like they don't know me as an officer. They know me as Anthony Ganji and they know when I'm being stressful or when I'm being under a stressful situation. And they also know how I react to that. You know, so sometimes it's great for me to be able to share that story with a loved one because they know how to talk to me. And if I don't make the effort to do that every day, I go through these changes and eventually the person you once knew is not that person anymore. And another thing I noticed here that would help kind of agree with the thought I just mentioned is the fact that in the end, if something happens, who's going to continue the battle for you? It's going to be your loved ones. And if you keep them out of the loop, you know, at the end of the day, the battle's going to be lost. I, I, I've seen so many wives, husbands step up after their loved one goes through something inside a correctional facility, because at that point, they're not held to the same restrictions like going on right now. Yeah, you, maybe my husband can't speak, but I can. And that's what we do. And also with the show on a national level, maybe if you work in New York, you can't speak about New York issues, but you could speak about California's issues and California could speak about New York issues, kind of having that one voice. But either way, this was a, a great topic, guys. Very informative. I'll get it up. I'll get it released shortly. Uh, and I'm assuming we need to do this again because I, I think really people need to understand this perspective of how the families are affected by the sacrifices of those frontline heroes. Now, guys, if you haven't, the show Tear Talks for you, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post up a video. Stay safe.